This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 63 of Healthy Critters Radio on the Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you by Biostar US. Find them online at biostarus.com. On today's show, we share tips for keeping a beautiful summer coat on our horses and dogs. The breed of the show is the Plymouth Rock Chicken. Tigger shares information about Biostar's new hydration formulas. And in Coffee Clutch, we share the funny nicknames and songs we sing to our animals. Join us. So, Jennifer, you and Glenn have been on a exciting adventure. We have. We were gone for an entire two weeks, and wow. we did our bucket list wow. trip to Alaska. Yay, Yay! My favorite place. Your favorite oh, wow. place. Now, I'm curious, Tigger. What made Alaska your favorite place? And then I'll tell you why I th- I thought it was awesome. The combination of incredible wilderness, sea, mountain, forest. The plethora of animals. Oh, interesting. For Mm. me, we did not see quite the plethora of animals as you did, but we stayed in much more urban areas. Um, For me, it was the incredible variety and intensity of the flora and fauna. It wasn't just a lot of different kinds Mm. of plants, and it it was just intense. Like, you know how in an urban area the people and the buildings are very intense. They're populated and it's got a certain mm-hmm. energy. For me, nature was that. It was like intense well, exactly. nature. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, it almost had mm. an an energy or a vibe just like a city would, except it was Mother Nature's intensity or yep. vibe. And we did we did quite a bit of hiking now, not the crazy cool kind of hiking like you see on National Geographic. It's a little more tame than that. But we did a lot of hiking while we were there. And... I took zillions of pictures and the, just the crazy, amazing, awesome, every, you just didn't know where to turn next. Every time you turned yep. around, there was something eye popping going on. Yep. And it was just oh, astounding. Wow. I would love to go back and do some more hiking. We didn't get to do a whole bunch. It was sort of a whirlwind trip, but there were several locations that I wouldn't mind going back and doing some more just to see how the light plays across everything. Cause there's a lot of cloud cover. And then occasionally when the sun breaks through, it ju- you just get these incredible scenes. Yeah. yeah. Did I say incredible about 50 times just now? Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Yes. Did, did Now, did you, where did you sail around? Were you, you started in? We started up north. We, we flew from, from Florida up to Anchorage because that's where the airport is. Yeah. Took a train from Anchorage to Seward, which was just eye popping. Oh, you did depart from Okay. It yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And then we sailed from Seward. We did, I don't know if I can get them all. We did Ketchikan. We did mm-hmm. Juno, Icy oh, wow. Strait Point, which is in Huna, beautiful island. Uh, we did one more. We did four port. Uh, we did the, we, we sailed up to the Mendenhall Glacier. And sailing up to it, okay, that was interesting. We got to walk up to a glacier, much more interesting. Yeah. Sailing up oh, wow. to it, it just looks like a big white blob because you have no perspective. You know, it's huge, but there's nothing between you and it. So you mm-hmm. really can't tell how huge it is. But we got to walk up there, and that was really awesome. And what other town we did? There was one more in there. Skagway. We did Skagway. Ah. Yeah. And the people, lovely, pleasant, welcoming everywhere we went. Um, so that was fun. We found a couple of really interesting little shops that were owned by folks who actually lived there. That was fun. Got to chat with them about why they lived there and what it was like to live there. And one of the towns we went to, Skagway, tiny little itty-bitty town that you would expect to see in a tourist destination. It was three square blocks and mostly uh, reproduction or original buildings from the early 1900s. Obviously, wow. Obviously, they keep it that way for us tourists, and, and I thank them because it was fun. Oh, wow. But we're walking down this beautiful wide street. It must have been four lanes wide. Not a single automobile anywhere i'm going this is odd there's no there's no cars downtown there's no traffic maybe they don't allow cars because everybody was just walking down the middle of the street like okay 
Uh, and there were no cars, oh, but wow. the, the town only has a full-time residency of 750. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll explain it. And the street yep. was immaculate. There wasn't a piece, there wasn't a grain of sand anywhere. Wow, they keep this real town really clean. And then about an hour and a half into our stroll around town, the wind kicked up. And then I realized that the street was not clean because they sweep it. It was clean because of the gale force freaking winds that come through there every afternoon. Oh, that is so funny. I could literally, I stuck my arms out and I could lean forward at about a 45 degree angle and stay standing. And the locals are like, what wind? (laughs) What wind? Is there wind? Wow, yes, wow. Uh, yeah, the wind is the wind is a uh, it's a significant part of life up there. Yep. It it really has an effect on everything and and the way the plants grow and stuff mm-hmm. depends on which side of a mountain they're on. So yeah, if you're a, if you're a nature fan and enjoy just being in it or if you are a person who loves cities and loves that kind of electric vibe that happens in a city, try Alaska. I think you might find a new friend. <laughs> Because you get what, you, yeah. what animals did you see? Let's see here. We saw eagles every single Everywhere. day. It's like every mile. Everywhere. Bald and eagle. It doesn't matter how many times I see him, I still get goosebumps. I know. Uh, we saw eagles. We saw Ooh. a couple of quick glimpses of moose. Oh, wow. Yeah. I love cool. moose. Yeah. It wasn't, My it's favorite. not, it's just the very, barely the beginning of the rut. So they weren't out a whole bunch, but we got a couple of quick glimpses. Uh, we saw. Let's see here. Horses, because we went went and visited listeners, so that was a lot of fun. We got to go uh, carriage driving with Lisa, and we got to go with, uh, I can't remember everybody's names. We went, we saw Patty and Corinna, and I think Emily and Lisa, everybody. So thank you guys. It was a lot of fun. So we got to see horses up in Alaska. We saw, I saw one deer, black-tailed deer. Spotted that one on the side of a mountain. Wow. Uh, Doll sheep. Got to see those Mm. through a telescope. They're cool. Through a telescope. We saw seals, sea lions, and whales. Yeah. Uh, a variety of little teeny tiny fish everywhere. Did you see any sea otters? Did not see any sea otters that I know of. We saw a lot of sea mammals at a far enough distance that I'm going, ah, I'm not sure which kind it is. It could be a seal, could be a sea lion. Mm-hmm. So we may have seen otters, but we couldn't discern. And right. we saw one fake um, armadillo. Fake <laughs> <laughs> on the one train wide, somebody had taken a life sized plastic armadillo <laughs> and put it on one of the outcroppings oh. that you could almost reach out and touch it on the train and probably could have uh-huh. if you were scurrying up. And it's so oh, funny because all the I tourists are going by, going, Oh my armadillo. god, there's an armadillo! Going, Yeah, right, it's an armadillo, it's in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, so that was kind of a I used a to see them on the side of the road all the time yeah we have, yeah they're That's a tropical funny. critter guys they're not going to be in alaska <laughs> no. and uh, lots of lots of friendly people so anybody who wants who has alaska on their bucket list go or run never thought run of going to alaska there. give it a go yeah it awesome. it's great and it patty great. that should be on your bucket yeah. list well peter, peter wants to go you'd That's never get one. peter out of there <laughs> I, yeah he'd that say let's Wyoming. move I actually uh, yeah, came. I, I guess, actually yeah. came across a number of people who lived there full time who who said that they came to visit and they couldn't get it out of their system. And at some point in you know years later or months later, came up and and they live there now. And the nice part is in the winter, in the summertime, you have eighteen hours of daylight. Yeah, not so great in the winter when you have eighteen hours of not daylight. But uh, yeah. yeah, it was really cool. It was. It's just an incredible spot. You got to see it. It is. It's an incredible place. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds awesome. Yeah. But we also have an incredible show. We do. We do. We do. We're going to so talk, we're gonna talk about going. summer very shortly. There we go. So we're having a roundtable discussion on sharing our tips for keeping beautiful summer coats on our horses and dogs. And uh, I'm going to start off by um, <laughs> a tip that I have that um, if you don't have a show horse, it works great. And it, it's a recent tip because we've been having all this rain. And one morning I brought Lion in, Lionheart in, and he was, <laughs> he had mud from the tip of his mouth all the way back to his tail. And being a chestnut, it, it wasn't obnoxious, but he was just coated like he had a blanket of mud. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to give this horse a bath. 
And then I thought, well, you know, letting it sit on his coat, get all those soil microorganisms, you know, get into his skin and I'll just leave it be. So that night, because they're on night turnout, I turn him out and he's still, you know, some of the mud has come off, but there's still quite a lot on. And, and of course, it rained. But this time, when I brought him in the next morning, he was glistening. <laughs> His coat <laughs> looked amazing. So now I'm seeing the benefit of sort of mud bath therapy for horses because he looked incredible. And I never touched him with shampoo or anything. Well, it also pulls off, you know, a lot well, of them are skin. still shedding. Yeah, and it pulls out some of that the hair too. That's a great idea. <laughs> and it, it takes time. Remember, Patty, I remember with you, if if we washed a horse and then we just, you know, we turned them out and then they started going down, oh. we would we would be screaming. <laughs> Get that horse up. <laughs> and now I'm thinking, man, were we stupid? We should have just no, let them totally. get well, because you know, it, 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 I I agree. It's so funny. Because I have this darling lady that's working for me in the barn, and she's so cute because sometimes she has to put the horses back in their stalls, and she's like, oh, they're down and they rolled. And I just, it's just like, you know, they're going to ride the same dirty as they are clean, <laughs> you know? And um, she gets them pristine, and I love it. I truly love it. But it's, you know what? They go the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If cleanliness was the key to Piaf and Passage and One Tempe's, oh. man be all over it (laughs) i was gonna say line would be back out of the field (laughs) we'd be tacking them up tomorrow red clay and all so what 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 kind of tips do you guys have mine is mud well figure you know my you know my tip coconut oil. my number one tip coconut oil of course Well, I bet it's so funny because Tigger, we got to get on that book. We just we have to do. keep adding. What are we at? We we got we got to be at two thousand uses. Yeah. <laughs> so, coconut coconut oil is you know, is just to me if you're gonna um, and I I've done it with dogs, but it uh, it gets a little greasy. That does kind of bite you in the butt a little bit. But you have it to really like dilute it, it for dogs. You need such a tiny, yeah, truly, tiny truly. Yeah. Um, but for the horses, I just put a little bit in. They're after, you know, bath or whatever water and I just let it soak in and I let it stay on them. And I also put it up in their tails and it just gives such a beautiful glisten and it just makes them, I think makes them look incredible, but it it also really helps because that's, yeah. And then you, yeah. And then you rinse it off and then you scrape it, but it's my favorite for that. And also, and if your lips are chapped during the process, you can put some on your lips and then you can, and then you can get, work it around in your cuticles and it helps your nails. Oh my gosh. There's three more Tigger. (laughs) It'll be a long book. How about you, Jennifer? Well, you kind of touched on on one of mine, and for the same reason, I just I discovered it the same way you did. Of course, we're here in Ocala, Florida, where we get just crazy, incredibly hard downpours, sometimes amounting to several inches all in one fell swoop. And our horses live outside, and it's incredible how soft and shiny and clean their coats are after it rains, if you see them before they roll. So I think my tip is avoid the shampoo. Yeah. Avoid the liniment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. rinse them like crazy. Um, Cause when they stand out in the, in the rain, they'll be standing out there for two, three, four, five hours getting poured on. That's how yeah. much rinsing is happening there. So I think if we shampoo less and liniment less and rinse more, our coat, their coats mm-hmm. are going to be a lot healthier and shinier because most of the time, if they're not shiny, it's because the skin is dry and the yeah. hair has been stripped of its natural oils. And personally, in my yeah. opinion, once it's been stripped, there's no, really, you can't really replace it with the real thing. You can, you can kind of get some of that back, but it's not the same as the hair that's shiny all by itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so rent, you know, shampoo and, and liniment less, uh, rinse more. And I'm big on apple cider vinegar. I mean, I think that's a really good brightening, shining, when you don't need to use coconut oil, yeah, um, right. which is a real conditioner. I've never used it. Oh, yeah. God, it's great. And it, it, it makes smell, your horse smell like the pantry. Like salad. <laughs> but it's, it's <laughs> really like good. Salad. It's, while it lasts on them, it's a really nice fly repellent. 
Yeah. And that's, I'm glad you touched on fly repellent because that's my other tip. The bug spray you use, in my opinion, can have a real effect Mm -hmm. on. Can burn the hell out of them. It can burn their hair. It can make it sunburn more than it would normally. Yep. Um, so obviously we have to use bug repellents on our horses in most places because they just need it, especially a horse that's a show horse because they can't just be out there swatting flies and crunching dirt in to help, help keep them off. And I've noticed that depending on what kind of fly spray we're using, their coat has a different feel to it so that Mm -hmm. when it's clean, it also has a different look to it. Uh, We're using one right now for Scooter. Scooter uses the drip on fly repellent, like you put it on like a dog. Because of his, mm. his, he has insect allergies, so we're trying to do everything we can. But when you use that, you can't use a chemical fly spray because that's too much chemical. Oh. It's bad for your mm. horse, right? But you can use a natural fly spray that has eucalyptus oil or rosemary and things like that. And we're using one now that has mm. neem oil in it. Oh, that's what I use. I love that product. And it, and it's his oh, coat is a, it can is, be strong. So yes, you, you have, have to, to. You can to. water it down. Yeah. yeah, said that right on the thing. If your horse is sensitive, you can water it down. I can use it straight from the bottle on Scooter because he has a very dense pony coat, um, right. so it, it works okay just straight from the bottle for him, except on his face where we water it down. But I've noticed his coat is softer, and the hair this is themselves, the individual hairs, are softer and more pliable. And he's much, much shinier than when we were using the chemical ones, which I, I, I think, I always feel like they encourage sunburning on the hair. I don't know. Well, Maybe it's just yeah, me. I think, I think that they yeah, attack they may- the immune system. Well, there you go. That might be it, too. I think day mm-hmm. after day after day after day, you're breathing that in. Yeah. I mean, the horses. And the skin is, you know, the largest, really, receptacle. So yeah. it gets into the bloodstream. It stresses the gut. It stresses, yeah. Where do you guys this, weigh? Where do you guys weigh in on fly sheets? Patty, go. Oh, definitely. I um, we've got fly. And it's, it, the one thing that I had forgotten is that Virginia breeds some of the nastiest biting flies. Yeah, <laughs> you lead the nation. They're, they're, well, but there. I mean, um, I there. You know, there's. I'm telling you, the mosquitoes that Texas State bird, but. <laughs> So I, I'm all about the uh, fly sheets. Um, but our, you know, like Tig's horses, you know, all our, ours are going out at night. And I, unlike a lot of people that train at this level, I like my horses to be out as much as possible. And like, I yep. mean, I, if it's raining, except this last deluge that we had, that was kind of interesting. I like my horses to be out. I want them out. I want them out all the time. Moving, um, when it's being a horse. Like, moving. Yep. Yeah. Moving. Um, and like my young horses, they go out all the time, but I don't put fly sheets on them when they're young, young, like I have a three-year-old that I haven't put a fly sheet on, but I definitely do the fly mask just because again, the flies are bad. And especially with after all the rain, then their eyes start to drip. And then of course they start to get sores, you know, under their, uh, you know, the skin starts to get affected. So I, I love, I love the fly sheets. Um, I like the ones with the bellies. I really, I actually in um, Texas, I had read up about one, the zebra one that's supposed to repel mosquitoes and biting flies because of the pattern mm-hmm. it's supposed I, I forgot exactly why but it's not it's like a bucus i think it's supposed to confuse the fly yeah yeah something yes so i have that um they are ridiculous looking <laughs> just so you know but but i you know so far it seems like it works what is the name of the product with the neem in it its name is escaping yeah, me um, at the, moment. the one i use is from equiderma that's it, Equiderma. Equiderma, that's the one I have. Yeah. I it, love it. It's, it's kind of a milky color. Yes, stuff. it looks like chocolate yeah. milk. Yes. That's what I, That's the fly spray I use. Yeah, and, it, and you're right. It is very strong. I've heard people say, oh, I don't use it anymore. It gave my horse hives. But it does say in the light label, if you read the fine print, that it's very strong. And if you have a horse that's even a little bit sensitive, or if you're one of those people that's a little heavy-handed, uh, yeah, mix it with water, half and half or some such. And yeah. if your horse is not right. working, like <laughs> none of mine are, they're all retired, um, you can spray it once. And as long as they're not in a in a rainstorm, it lasts for a few days. Yeah. So you don't have to keep reapplying oh, it, which is really nice. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. There you go. Um, yeah, that's what I use. I couldn't think of it. I could not think of the name of it. I couldn't I either. Like it. <laughs> now, okay. I, I, I'm so glad you said it. I didn't realize I used it. I didn't know it had neem in it. I it didn't is. know it was called Equiderm because I knew it was an herbal Equiderm. spray and I don't yeah. like. Isn't it called Equiderma? Yes. Yeah. Equiderma, yeah. 
So now, what do you guys use for dogs? Oh, dogs. Our dogs don't live out, so I never well, worry about a sun Well, my thing coat. is garlic. I do the the springtime garlic uh-huh. um, to help you know with the biting stuff. Well, I was just talking um, about you know general coat care in coat. the summer. I have Ray brush them. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> I I rely on things like creeks and ponds. Ah, yeah. Well, there is that. <laughs> um, and when I have to bathe them, I really love that Warhorse Pet Shampoo. Oh my yeah. gosh! Well, that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think grooming, just using a brush on your dog, is underrated because it's such a pain, and I yeah. hate the way dogs smell, but. It's amazing how shiny their coat is if you brush them on a regular basis, like yep. every single week. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And you get all that old hair out. It's the old hair. Yeah. The old hair yep. just makes them all yep. look dull and, and icky looking. Yeah. And let me tell you, adding an egg to their food. Really? Whoa. Oh, my gosh. How often? Well, I have been doing it once or twice a week. Mm-hmm. And and I will say some of my dog's coats – you know they're most you know they're black primarily right. they're i could i can see my face in them <laughs> i mean they're that <laughs> shiny now wow. and it's all the silica in the egg oh now do you use mm. shell and all do you cook or not give me more details I, I don't cook um i have cooked but i we have our own chickens and oh so you uh, get good fresh eggs they're all yep. organic so yep. you know go out collect the eggs and Crunch up the the shells because it's calcium, and uh, yeah, add it to their food. You just and like toss course, it in a blender I or something. I'm going to do that. No, I just crack the egg on the bowl, open it up, crumble up the shell, and throw it in. Really? Uh huh. I'm gonna try. Now, that. The do you prob- do an egg per dog? It's one egg per dog. Now, um, how big are your dogs for those of us who out there? Because we don't want people <laughs> overfeeding their chihuahuas. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, my smallest is 35 pounds, and the largest is 70 plus. So, you know, maybe for your chihuahuas and your papillons and your uh, Maybe you do hot a dogs. quarter of an yeah. egg. Yeah, a little bit less. Yeah, because I was just thinking of my Frenchies. I'd probably give them you could probably split an egg between split them. One. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But I, I caught Wookie the other day climbing up the straw, I bet in straw, so a big stack of straw. She's climbing up the straw stack to get to a hen's nest to oh, steal an egg. Shame on her. Oh, that is <laughs> bad. Shame on her. Now, oh, that's I'm glad you said straw. Let me put a plug in. I personally think horses' coats are nicer when they live on straw. I'm just yeah, putting it I out there. Too. Oh, I think they're more comfortable, too. Yep. yep. And if you don't like picking straw because it's a pain in the butt, it there is. is there is chopped straw available, and it comes in a big bag, just like chopped forage, and it comes from several different suppliers oh. in the United States. You can buy it. Doesn't really cost any more than high quality shavings, and you sift it exactly oh. the same way you do shavings. And I love it. You know, I've been using um, hemp bedding. Yeah, I've hemp. heard. I've heard people talking about that. You like it? And I use it as Wait, the base it? under the called? straw. Hemp. You know, hemp. Oh, shredded hemp, hemp. Okay. yeah, yeah not yeah, yeah. smokable. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> and because one of the problems with straw is that it, you know, when they start peeing a lot, especially in the summer, the stalls can get really wet. It's, it's yeah. straw. It's not as absorbent. Which absorbent. is chopped straw so, is absorbent because the run they run it through a hammer mill, which breaks open the cell walls. Uh, so it's absorbent, very similar to we. A lot of people have used what, what we would call green sawdust from the sawmill. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, about yeah, the yeah. same absorbency as green sawdust is. So it's not quite as absorbent as like pellets, but definitely way more absorbent than straw from a bale. Regular straw. Yeah, I used it so all year last summer, and I loved it. The hemp at, as the base. Yep. Especially around the pea areas, and then I just pile up the straw on yeah. top, and it, it, it works great. And hemp, I mean, we compost everything, so hemp breaks down much faster than straw, actually. So for our dogs and their bedding to help their coats stay shiny and healthy, any thoughts? My dog's like Egyptian cotton. There you go. You know, my bed. <laughs> 3,000. They like yeah. a king-size well, pillow. There's a, a lot of folks have... Um, 
barn dogs that live outside or, you know, that kind of thing. Is there, does it make a difference what they sleep on, do you think? Our dog just lives on your average dog bed that we buy at the pet store, so. I mean, if I had a dog that was living outside in a dog house, I would be bedding in straw. Yeah, I think, I, I think I'm I on your thinking. page, too. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement on that one. Yeah, straw. I would agree with that. Yep. Yeah. There we go. But there I think go. the best place for a dog to sleep is on your bed. <laughs> <laughs> that's what my dogs think. And they think sleeping on my head, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> that's a different conversation altogether. There we go. Well, let us know yep. if you've got some great tips for uh, keeping your horses and dogs' coats um, beautiful during the summer. Just go to healthycrittersradio.com or find us on Facebook. <laughs> Hetty? We can't hear you, Hetty. Why not? Are you retarded? There's Hetty. <laughs> We're just mere humans, Hedwig. I'm oh sorry. Gosh. We're mere humans. Oh, my gosh. Challenge and also not that good at evolution. I would agree with you. We are devolving as humans. We now communicate via cartouches that we call emojis. They're just the modern hieroglyphs. Also, mm. you are not Pomeranian, so no, you are evolutionarily challenged. You are not your best self. <laughs> not our best self. Well, speaking of best selves, Hedwig, uh, um, many, yes. many, many humans do not feel that their life is lived to its fullest unless they are surrounded by many, many creatures of various species. So we wanted to find out how you feel about humans who like to keep exotic pets in the home along with their Pomeranians and or other breeds of dog. So then a Valhund is not an exotic pet? No. No. <laughs> what about a tortoise shell cat who is part demon? No. <laughs> nope. I think it's called domestic. A giant yeah. horse with called boot bat. Nope. Nope. We're thinking like a... A boa constrictor or... I was thinking a saber-toothed tiger. (laughs) Yeah, that would count. Those are extinct. Okay. You can't keep extinct things as pet people. Well, you know, boa constrictor, python, um, lizard, lion, guinea pig. (laughs) Why would you live with something entire focus? is one day in six to eat a pig or you. That's ridiculous. That's not a pet. A man came to fix the windshield of our vehicle, and he had a lizard attached to him, and he gave the lizard a kiss, and it sat on his shoulder while he fixed our windshield, and he called it by its name, and he fed it dead crickets. Ew. I... I can only tell you that that man is going to spend a long, sad life alone with his lizard. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making untoward suggestion there. No okay. mom will no. live with him. No. No. Uh, oh, that's what she said no. <laughs> okay. So, th- so there's no exotic no. pet that you would like to have. A monkey? A monkey? I would not have guessed. In what way would a monkey improve your existence, Hedwig? Flinging. Because you don't have oppos- opposable thumbs to do that for yourself? I can only do a stencher. I can't fling the stencher. <laughs> well, there we go, okay. folks. Get, get, a, get a monkey for your Pomeranian or other breed of dog so that uh, there can be proof flinging. Would appreciate a monkey. Excuse me? I mean, if you think about it, I have struggled for years with the epistemological questions surrounding my own monkey or lack of monkey nest. So I know from monkey, <laughs> whereas others might not. Gotcha. Well, thank like, you very much, Hedwig. I just don't think my brother understands monkey or not monkey. He is more goblin or not goblin? And the answer is goblin. So would, would a goblin be an appropriate exotic pet? No, because we have one. He is my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So you would I you like to replace your brother? Would saying. you like to replace your goblin brother with a monkey? Is that an option? Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the human would be upset. She's fond of the goblin. Well, that doesn't matter. Mm. It's all about Hedwig. It doesn't matter if your human's upset. It matters if you're upset. He might not. Yeah. My life and might go down. The monkey could get cheese for you. <gasps> yes. Oh, <sighs> but the brother learned how to open the door in Florida and get free. Yes, out of my treat bag. So, so a That's goblin great. does have some merit. Let's just put that out there. A goblin, as an exotic pet in your home, has some merit. Yes. But you hmm. have to learn to speak Swedish or he just will not cooperate. There we go. So it requires a learning curve on the part of others in the home. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you That's have to have enough. a lot of patience because he does this thing where he hops and hops and hops and hops and hops on stiff legs in a circle. And he, he gapes his jaws and he turns himself into a C shape, which is a little weird. But it's normally around five in the morning. So we just roll with it. There we go. So to, to wrap this conversation up, if, let me see if I've got this right, uh, Hedwig. Exotic pets in the home overall, not a good idea, unless it's either a chimp or a well-schooled Swedish Valhund goblin. goblin. No, no, not a chimp. No, 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 no. Monkey. Wrong. Monkey. I'm sorry. Spider monkey. monkey. Orangutan. Oh, a spider monkey. monkey. Okay. Spider, spider monkey. monkey. Spider monkey or goblin. <laughs> Cat goblin. There we go. Well, thank you very much, Hedwig. We appreciate your input. Bye. Thanks, Hedy. Bye. And now it's time for the breed of the show. So we are now at the breed of the show segment, and I have chosen to do a chicken again because I am investigating chickens because now that I live back in Virginia, I actually just recently went to go buy a car for my son and we went to these very nice people's house and they had two um, silky chickens as pets and they had they were like literally brought them in the house they were incredibly affectionate they had chicken diapers (laughs) (laughs) it just I mean it was kind of I was like this is just anyway it was just pretty fascinating so I'm like all in my chicken mode so I've chosen the Plymouth Rock which is an American bred chicken and I was in on the quest because some of my friends um, back in Texas are um, getting adding to their chicken herd. <laughs> what, flock. Is, what would you call that, Tigger? Flock. F- flock. And she was saying, oh, man, I got this one that I really like, and it turns out it's a rooster. So one of the first things I want to do is figure out how do you really – how do they how old are they when they sex them? Because you can't really tell. But they don't really sex them until they're four or five months. You probably know this, Tigger. Mm-hmm. I did not. But they also say that crowing is one of the indications that it's not a hen. So that's just for everybody. <laughs> that, that was a good one. I think I could figure that. But they said don't count on it. But anyway, the Plymouth Rock is actually one of the most common ones. It's sort of the, uh, uh, if people look it up, um, it's sort of the chicken that you think that, you know, when you think of a chicken. It was first seen in Plymouth Rock in the 19th century. Um, It's been uh, really one of the most popular chickens because it has a dual purpose. It is a very good layer, and it's also a very good meat bird. And... um, they are, as far as egg layers, they're very productive. Um, they have, um, they, when they're younger, they anywhere from four to five eggs a week. Um, as they get older, they get, they go down. Um, they have very good resistance to cold and to heat. They are early featherers, which I guess is helpful with the, the weather. Um, they, as far as their characteristics, they have a single comb. They, their wattles and their earlobes are bright red. Their beak are yellow. Um, they have four toes, which I'm also learning that there's apparently ones that have five toes, Tigger. Is that? Yeah. I don't have you, any of those. Yeah. Okay. But apparently there's some that have more. They're, uh, the eggs that they lay are brown and they're large. Um, they can handle confinement well. So if people want to make them an apartment bird, I guess they could. They're most happy free ranging though. What color are they? Variety of different. Well, there there's one that's called Bard, I guess B A R R E D, and that's this. It's a speckled one. If you look one up, it looks you know it's kind of the speckled one that you. I don't know. I just remember being young and reading like books about farm animals, and that was the type of 
chicken. It's really the most common chicken, apparently. But it's kind of black. Uh, the bard, I think, is the black and sort of gray speckled. There's also a silver, oh, a blue, yeah. a buff, and a partridge. So doesn't it, did you just look it up? Because it's a very common. Yeah, it, it, it actually looking. looks a lot like some other heritage breeds. The Dominican oh, does it? looks sort of like this. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. And, oh, their personality, this just made me laugh. They describe them as smart, docile, and plucky. <laughs> I don't know what plucky means, but I just wanted to say it. I don't know if sort calling of, a chicken I plucky is a... good. Um, yeah. I, I, I think so. I don't know. Does that mean his feathers but fall plucky. out? I, I, think, I think it means it, it's, I don't know, it's plucky. <laughs> I think brave, so, plucky, you know, sort of. What's that? Brave. You know, a plucky chicken yeah. instead of a brave oh, yeah. soul. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. But I also found out if you indeed were looking for uh, the Plymouth Rock as a one-day-old chick, you can get it for two dollars and ninety cents off the internet. <laughs> okay, and so, they do ship them that way. So, okay, but may I just intercede because I have had such an awakening having chick babies here. Um, you know, oh, from that's mother. right. Yes. Yes. You would um, never ship a chicken or a chick. I th- when I as I watch how the hen teaches the chickies and mm. the whole interaction and how they sleep underneath her at night and some ride on oh. her backs and there's that's not what they get when they are raised in an incubator. No. Ship somewhere. Yeah. I I just I I feel really strongly that it, it's way better to get baby chicks from a farmer. Um, and I wonder, or, like, and I wonder, that's, that's a good question. Like, how do you do that? Because everybody I've said is like, okay, I'm going to start looking at some chickens and whatever. They're like, oh, well, you know, they got. Supply has got... a chicken swap every, every month. Oh. And, and okay. the breeders and stuff on Saturday bring all their chickens and you walk around all their trucks and meet their chickens and the, and the young chickens, and you buy them, or you swap with them. Oh, that's so funny. I just, it's a whole other world. It's just fascinating. But I think that's a really good point, because when I was reading this, that they actually, I didn't know they shipped baby chicks. I had yeah. no idea. Um, but That's how, one, you know, when you walk into a feed store, and they have all the mm-hmm. chicks around Easter, that they're all, yeah. that's, that's where they oh. have the lights. And, and you hear their cries. I mean, for yeah. the moment you look in the story, you hear all these little baby birds. And with when they're with their mom, I mean, they cheap, but it's not stressed. And she That's makes a really a good point. Um, I, I do have a funny chick story. If I'm we always just, up oh, for I'd a funny chick it. story. It, it, it's, it's recent. Is it going to be plucky? It will be plucky. So okay, one of the please, hens decided to have, decided to nest in the feed room. The feed room is attached via a sliding door to the hay room. Most of the time, I leave the sliding door open so that it's easy to walk from the feed room into the hay room. Um, well, she decided to create a nest in some, you know, dropped hay and stuff that was sort of in that opening. And we start, so she has her 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 babies, and there's four of them. And then Peter and I start hearing these these this chirping sound coming from within the walls and he said oh that's got to be like baby wrens i went why would wrens be in the wall we were looking up we were trying to find the nest for two days and we finally discovered that that sound was coming from between the boards between the back of the stall and the feed room so there was sort of a there was, you know, this is a really old barn. So there was sort of a hole in the, the facing boards, not in the stall mm-hmm, boards. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's where that chick was. Now, oh. how in God's name it got, I mean, it that there. other corner of the feed room jumped in. And then because it was so scared, what, once we discovered where it was, when we went reached down to try to get it, it ran. <laughs> oh, no. Well, finally, it, I guess it was so tired and so thirsty after two days, it allowed Peter to catch it. 
and it just curled up on his chest and he he dipped his hand in water and it just drank water and water and water out of his hand and and then he oh. took it back to the mother and because I was a little nervous that you know maybe she go that's not mine I, I don't remember that thing and he, right. she just took him right or her right under her wing and now I oh. did, so we moved them <laughs> out to the chicken house and of course she refuses to go into the nice part of the chicken house we made for her she would Mm -hmm. much rather be in the the dog pen which is you know an exer crate you know a folding collapsible right right Right. exer ex pen so we you know created a little we made a roof over it and you know put put Mm -hmm. straw so she'd be comfortable and then Peter opens it in the morning so that she can take the chickies out. So this little mm-hmm. chick that got stuck has it, – it's a, a golden chick with a black spot on the top of his or her head. So it makes it very easy to recognize him or her. So mom is out in the grass teaching everybody to pick up bugs. And, and the little chick with the black spot got a piece of a worm. And he, she was so excited. The mother's moving on and calling and all the other chicks are running after the mom. And this little chick is standing there with this big prize. I'm not going <laughs> anywhere until I eat this thing. And she's like screaming at it. And it's like, oh, okay. I, all right. I burst out oh. laughing. I thought this is a, this is the most interesting personality in a chicken. So you need to watch, video some of this. Watch for the further adventures of Spock. I was going to say a plucky, a plucky. He <laughs> made it. He made it out from the wall. <laughs> plucky the chicken. Plucky the chicken. Follow the adventures. Oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait to hear about it. I know. We're going to have to do a plucky the chicken corner. <laughs> He's going to have his own segment. Well, there you go. You're learning. We're learning everything uh, about chickens and good ones to have. So this, our Plymouth Rock, I think is. A good first starter chicken, if that's what you want in your backyard. But I agree with Tigger. Get them with when they've been raised by their chicken mamas. And here we are at Critter Nutrition. And today I'm going to talk about the new equine hydration formulas from Biostar. As most of you know, adult horses are 65% water and foals are 80% water. When we think about the size of an adult horse, that's a lot of water that needs regular replenishing. A 1,000-pound horse consumes an average 10 gallons of water per day. Increased workload or elevated environmental temperatures increase that demand, which can be as high as 16 gallons a day. Hot, humid days can cause a working horse to lose up to 4 gallons of water an hour a rate that cannot be replaced immediately by drinking. Losing water means losing electrolytes. The definition of dehydration in horses is the point when body tissues don't have enough water to function properly. Horses can lose up to 5% of their body weight in fluids before showing signs of dehydration. Yet, a 4% loss in fluids affects performance. Unlike humans, the sweat of a horse contains high levels of electrolytes, sodium chloride, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Electrolytes are also lost to the body through urine and feces. Dextrose is commonly added to equine electrolyte formulas on the theory that sugar helps the absorption of sodium, just as it does in humans. However, two separate studies conducted by Kentucky Equine Research showed that neither glucose nor dextrose increased electrolyte uptake. Muscle glycogen replacement. Depleted glycogen in the muscle leads to high lactate levels, which contributes to muscle fatigue. Horses can't replenish glycogen as quickly as humans can. Various studies point out that the resynthesis of glycogen after exercise requires adequate intercellular water and electrolytes. The transmucosal pathway. When we use water as a delivery system for electrolytes and nutrients, we can provide quicker absorption than giving electrolytes and other recovery nutrients in food. As a horse drinks, some of the electrolytes in the water are absorbed via the mucous membranes in the mouth. Absorption of electrolytes in water through this oral transmucosal pathway provides fast transportation to the systemic 
circulatory system. Absorption is rapid because of the rich vascular supply to the oral mucosa. Even the respiratory tract provides a large mucosal surface for nutrient and electrolyte absorption. Some of the electrolyte solution is absorbed as the water passes through the respiratory tract, and some is absorbed in the stomach and intestinal tract. This means, this faster means of water and electrolyte replenishment is particularly important for horses that are beginning to dehydrate, horses that are in heavy work, horses that are working in high heat and or humidity, or horses that are under stress from shipping, competition, summer heat, or winter cold. There are lots of hydration electrolyte supplements on the market. Often these formulas contain extraneous ingredients that are not part of the whole food paradigm, including fumaric acid, which is a food additive, citric acid made from genetically modified corn, predominantly produced in China, natural flavors created by the fragrance industry in France. A natural flavor could be a combination of over 200 different chemicals. Table salt, known as sodium chloride, highly refined bleach and devoid of the trace elements found in sea salt. Dextrose, made from genetically modified corn via hydrogen hydrolysis of cornstarch, a commonly used sweetener in packaged and processed foods. FD&C aluminum lake, an artificial color synthetically produced from coal tar or petroleum, commonly used in eyeshadows, mascara, nail polish, lip balm, lipstick, lip liner, sunscreen, supplements, and even some opioid pain medications. Artificial flavors, nearly the same as natural flavors as both their chemical cocktails made by the fragrance industry. Vegetable oil, highly refined, solvent extracted, usually blended from genetically modified corn and genetically modified soy. The focus of many conventional existing hydration formulas is on electrolytes, added sugars, and sometimes foods such as oats and alfalfa. What these formulas don't address is the synergy of GI tract support, mitochondria and ATP support, and the role of stress. Introducing Aquaforte and Elixir. Biostar is excited to release two new hydration and water enhancement formulas. Unlike other hydration formulas on the market, we have incorporated GI tract support, antioxidant support, stress support, and mitochondrial support with the electrolytes. These are truly the next generation of hydration supplements for horses because they address the whole horse. Aquaforte, designed to be added to drinking water, Aquaforte provides organic fennel seeds for digestion. Celtic sea salt and sea vegetables for isotonic electrolytes in the same ratio that is lost in sweat, plus additional trace minerals. Shilajit for mitochondria support and the production of ATP and CoQ10. Provides fulvic and humic acids for GI tract health. Organic apple powder for antioxidant support, including quercetin, one of the most powerful flavonoids known. Aquaforte is designed to be mixed in one to two gallons of water for fast hydration, four gallons of water if you want your horse to consume Aquaforte over a longer period of time. Elixir. For performance horses, Elixir will be available in two forms, as a paste administered orally by syringe for fast acting support or in a powder to be added to drinking water. Elixir paste consists of a base made from camelina oil, organic freeze-dried lemons, and lecithin from non genetically modified sunflower oil. To this foundation, we've added shilajit for mitochondria support, ATP and CoQ10 production, and cellular energy. Celtic sea and sea salt and sea vegetables for the isotonic electrolytes in the same ratio as sweat plus trace minerals. Microcrystallized aloe that coats the GI tract to protect the mucosa from irritation and gastric acid burn. Organic Tulsi leaves, also known as holy basil, one of the Ayurvedic adaptogenic herbs used to support glandular and circulatory systems under stress. Organic barley juice powder, providing the super antioxidant SOD that helps reduce muscle oxidative stress. Organic apple powder, containing the potent antioxidant quercetin, which helps reduce histamine and other allergic and inflammatory mediators. Camu Camu from the Amazon rainforest, known for being one of the richest sources of vitamin C, which is essential to synthesizing the collagen that maintains ligaments and tendons. Camu Camu's vitamin C and bioflavonoid content is nearly 20 times higher than that found in one orange. And this rainforest fruit provides a matrix of carotenoids for additional antioxidant support. Some horses drink well, whether they are at home or a show, but other horses don't drink drink as well when they ship or show, and some are very picky about the water smells and tastes. 
Stress, especially when combined with heat and humidity, can bring on dehydration and even delay the onset of drinking to remedy it. And hot weather isn't the only dehydration factor. Impaction colics can occur due to dehydration in cold weather. What we found when we tested Aquaforte and Elixir was that even the suspicious drinkers readily drank the water with these supplements added. We also found that consumption of the enhanced bucket of water then increased the horse's consumption of plain water. Horses on fresh pasture have the advantage of getting water through the blades of grass they eat. The combination of grass, nutrients in the grasses, and moisture, plus physical movement in their environment, are the fundamentals of equine biology. Horses that rely mostly on hay can be at a distinct disadvantage when it comes to being properly hydrated. Water is also a traditional delivery system for humans. Many plants used in traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda are taken as soups or teas. Laozi, the classical Chinese philosopher, described tea as, quote, the froth of the liquid jade, end quote. And it was an indispensable component, quote, to the elixir of life, end quote. Both traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda consider the spiritual component to herbs and plants. Each living plant has a measure of consciousness and the ability to affect our consciousness. Water is a fundamental element that when combined with specific herbs as a tea or super cold drink provides physical, emotional, and spiritual benefit to the animal or human drinking it. The two herbs we have chosen in our new hydration formulas, fennel and holy basil, have a long tradition of use in teas, soups, and plain water. Water with holy basil leaves is given to cows on Hindu holy days in India and Nepal. Shilajit, although a bioresin and not a plant, has traditionally been taken mixed with water. Today, the people of Nepal, including the Sherpas, make shilajit tea and drink it several times a day. Our new formulas, Aquaforte and Elixir, Both combine traditional medicine of plants, fruits, bioresin, and minerals with the essential element of water for the well-being and performance of of all horses. Aquaforte and Elixir will be available June 15th. Real horses and real dogs are healthier, perform better, and recover more quickly on real food. That's why Biostar empowers horse and canine owners with 100% whole food nutrition, supplements, and feeding programs. Biostar products are made at their own certified non-GMO facility in Gordonsville, Virginia, using real fruit ingredients that are raw, freeze-dried, or dehydrated, never cooked, and are free from artificial flavors, colors, soy, corn, wheat, and molasses. The Biostar product line includes a wide range of whole food, horse and dog supplements, treats, and unique artisan poultices that embrace the ancient and traditional uses of clay and plants. Visit BiostarUS.com today and learn about whole foods and canine and equine nutrition so you can make the best decisions about the care and health of your horses and dogs. That's BiostarUS.com. Whole food nutrition the way nature intended. And we're now, we've arrived at Coffee Clatch, and I thought it would be fun that we share some of the funny nicknames we give our animals and the songs we sing to them, um, because most horse dog people I know, we, we, our dogs have names, but they have multiple names, or our horses well, multiple, have multiple names. So, yeah. Patty, what kind of nicknames do you have for your, your animals? Well, I have, there's so many, like for instance, Gavin, his name is Gavin, he's known as Gibby, the Gibster. He's he he's probably he's probably the one that I I very least call him his real name. It's always Gib. I have a beautiful ragdoll cat, and her given name is Mila, and I don't think we've ever called her that. Uh, Hannah named her Fupa when she was a small kitten because she has a little bit of fat above her pelvic area, hence the name Fupa. Two little French bulldogs, and they. One's named Angus, and we call him Angu or Goo. <laughs> the other dogs. I don't. I, I mean, it's in. Yeah, where we get these from, I don't know. But you know, Burke, my Australian Shepherd, who is the fluffiest thing I do believe God ever put on this earth, and when he runs at me with his, he's got a very white chest and very cute, unbelievably adorable white legs, and he just looks like a little Pookie Bear. So I call <laughs> Pookie Bear, which is so queer, but um, but like yeah. Mm. There you go. Pookie bear. <laughs> oh my gosh. Pook. And I just, I'm, yeah. And, and, and then he'll turn his head and look at me and I'm just like, I melt. 
Every day, this happens to me. Every day, I like melt because he just runs and he's just so freaking cute. He's a little pook. He's a pooky bear. Do you do you not make up How about songs? You? Um, no, I don't. No, no, I, I have a feeling you do. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm starting to feel that I'm the weirdo in the group. You're the creative. Well, you're not the, the creative. Yeah, genius. you're the creative. I think. Yeah, um, I think that <laughs> I think you're safe. You're not in this group. You're not the only weird one. <laughs> Um, but do you have a song or two there too? I do. I do. <laughs> Buckaroo seems to have the m- most. I was number just going to say Buckaroo. Names. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So well, tell everybody who Buckaroo is. Buckaroo is an Australian shepherd. Um, <laughs> and where does he fit in the pack? Is he, uh, he's number in age. He's four and a half. So he's third in line. Okay. He has Kimasabi, Thunder Bear, Buckaroo. And then Crockett and Wookie. Okay. Um, he is a schmoozer. He just has this personality that he just schmoozes. He's really not interested in being an Australian shepherd in the classic sense. Like working, mm-hmm. like obeying, like coming, like I'll do anything <laughs> for you. Nah. He's a schmoozer. So Buckaroo became Mr. Schmoo. And... <laughs> And then it became Fu Man Shmu. And <laughs> and then, the, then I had to sing these songs. So here they are. The first one is from the movie Scrooge, the musical. And I thought it was such a great theme. So I borrowed it. it it's, you know, how. So anyway. <laughs> um, oh, God. Now it's gone completely out of my head. I'll start with the other one then. How do you do? Buckaroonie, how do you do? Bumpity bump. How do you do, Macaroonie? How are you? Bumpity bump. You are clever and you're kind and you've got a brilliant mind. You are certainly one of a kind. How do you do? <laughs> That's so cute. Oh, okay. I remember. Wait. Thank you, okay, Mr. Go. Schmoo. Thank you, Mr. Schmoo. It's so very, 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 very nice of Mr. Schmoo. Thank you, Buckaroonie. Thank you, Mash Patootie. It's a very, very, very nice. <laughs> this is just a free loot, everybody. What people need to, to know uh, to this. What people need to know is that Tick, Tigger does freestyles for a living. <laughs> I mean, you can see it's all so musical. It's so funny. This is a prelude to Radiothon. Stay tuned, folks. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Expect an award-winning tune and or epic poem. From Mr. Phone. Schmoo. No pressure. Uh, Mr. Uh, Schmoo and company. Mr. Schmoo just got a new nickname. Oh. And? As a few days ago, he became Cousin It. <laughs> <laughs> because Cousin his it. coat is so huge. It oh, is un- funny. It's unbelievable. So he is now known as Cousin It. So Jennifer... Surely you have nicknames or a song? I don't have a song. I'm not <laughs> prone to songs or poems, but Nigel does have a nickname. It's uh, Blowfish. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or the Big Blow. And that is an acronym. Blow, B-L-O, is Big Lumbering Oaf, <laughs> which really, really does describe his entire being completely is big lumbering oaf because that's pretty much oh, that's what he so is. Funny. Yeah. PT Scooter is uh probably predictably scoot and toot. Scoot and toot. <laughs> scoot and toot. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Yeah. Or, toot. or his other nickname is Scooter would you stop that? That's his other nickname. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had friends that had a dog that uh they it I forgot what the dog's real name but was say it was Ben and they'd like be Ben, damn it. Stop doing that. Damn it. Don't do that. They just eventually called the dog Damn It. That ended up being the dog's name was Damn It. I thought that was so funny. I had a mare, Patty. You probably remember her name, Katanga. Oh, God. Yeah, I called her Ar- Arnetta. Arnetta yeah. Schwarzenegger. She was, she, was a, she was a brick house. Wow. <laughs> yes. And she, I nicknamed her Leona Helmsley, the queen of. Oh, God. <laughs> Because I tell you, she had a wicked left hook. Oh, she took yeah. me out once in my leg. Like, ah, uh, yeah, um, yeah, Leona Helmsley. That's that was her nickname. She was all girl. That's all I'm going to tell you. I and a little bit of Arnalda. 
Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah, Arnolda Schwarzenegger. No, she was a she was a handsome, handsome mare. Yes, she very, was. Uh, very good looking one. So let us know if you have you know funny nicknames for your animals or sing funny. I, songs. Quite honestly, I'd like to hear of a song. I want to know who else out there has a schmoo song of some sort. I'm going to start to. We should yeah. ask Hedwig have for a song, for a song about. Pong. Oh, I think she yes. would do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think that's a. I think that's a very good thing. Um. I think so she won't Email us at uh, healthycrittersradio.com or on Facebook, Healthy Critters Radio. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks to our sponsor, BioStar US. You can find them online at BioStarUS.com. Get the Horse Radio Network phone app on iOS or Android by searching for Horse Radio Network in the App Store. It's free and easy to use. For details about today's show, go to HealthyCrittersRadio.com where you can find links, photos, and more information about our guests. As always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook under Healthy Critters Radio. Be sure to visit all the great shows on Horse Radio Network at HorseRadioNetwork.com. Love your dog. Hug your horse. Feed your chickens. Clean your litter box. Dance with your goat. Slither with your snakes. Howl at the moon. Hang with your hamster. Party with your parrot. Waddle with your walrus. Outwit your otter. Cuddle your cows. Rap with your raptor. Go chipping with your chipmunks. Forgive your fox. While hedging your hog. We also recommend that you rack with your raccoon. Gyrate with your giraffe. Meditate with a meerkat. Uber with your orangutan. Facebook with your flamingo. Ponder with your panda. Walk with your Wookiee. Yawn with your yak. Twitter with your toucan. Go raining with your reindeer. Dropbox your dragon. (laughs) 